In this video, we're diving deep into the art of decoding a company's balance sheet. I'm unleashing my secret wisdom to supercharge your investment game. Whether you're a rookie stepping into the stock market for the first time or a seasoned pro, brace yourself for the knowledge storm I'm about to unleash. Stick with me until the very end, and I promise you'll unlock game-changing insights you can immediately use in your investment strategy today. Don't miss out. Let's jump right in. Understanding a company's balance sheet is crucial when it comes to investing. A strong balance sheet can make the difference between a successful investment and losing it all. If a company is drowning in debt or running out of cash to support its operations, it's a warning sign that bankruptcy could be on the horizon. And if that happens, your investment might be in jeopardy. So let's explore the key factors that can impact your investments as we delve into the intricacies of a company's balance sheet. Let's break down the fundamentals of a balance sheet step-by-step. Step. A balance sheet is divided into three primary sections, assets, liabilities, and stockholders' equity. Assets. These are the valuable resources a business owns, and they hold monetary value. Think of assets as things like cash in the company's bank account or the manufacturing facilities used to create products. These are the company's possessions. Liabilities. Liabilities represent what the company owes to others. This includes things like loans from banks or outstanding payments owed to suppliers. In simple terms, liabilities are the company's obligations. The core accounting equation is assets equals liabilities plus stockholders' equity. It basically tells us how a company's assets are financed. We won't dive too deep into accounting jargon in this video, but remember this equation. It's crucial for understanding a balance sheet. Now both the asset and liability sections are further divided into two categories, current and non-current. Current assets are those that can be converted into cash within a year, such as short-term investments and accounts receivable. Non-current assets are long-term assets like property and machinery, whose full value can't be realized until after a year. Similarly, for liabilities, current liabilities are expected to be paid off within a year. Non-current liabilities are obligations that extend beyond a year. One interesting thing to note is that assets are listed in order of liquidity, which means how quickly they can be turned into cash. Cash itself is the most liquid asset, while less liquid assets like property and equipment are at the bottom of the asset section. Now that we have a solid foundation for why balance sheets matter, let's delve into a real-world example We'll use Apple as our case study to explore their balance sheet line by line and understand what you need to know. Let's dive right into Apple's balance sheet and start with the first line, cash and cash equivalents. The first part is straightforward. Cash is the money they have sitting in checking or savings accounts. But here's the interesting bit, cash equivalents. These are short-term, ultra-safe investments that can quickly be converted into cash. Why do companies like Apple park their money in these low-risk investments? Well, even a tiny return on these massive sums of cash can mean millions in extra earnings. Imagine having tens of billions of dollars. Every bit counts. Now let's move down the balance sheet to marketable securities. Marketable securities are already low-risk and can be easily converted into cash. They often include things like government bonds. Here's a pro tip. When calculating a company's true cash position, it's a good practice to combine cash, cash equivalents, and marketable securities. So as of the end of 2021, Apple had $34,940 in cash and cash equivalents, $27,699 in marketable securities, $127,877 in non-current marketable securities, Remember that all the numbers presented here are in millions. Adding these three numbers together, we get a staggering total of $190,516. That's the financial firepower Apple had on hand. But there's more to explore in their balance sheet. Now let's dive into accounts receivable. Imagine you own a mouth-watering hamburger stand. A customer approaches you, asking for a delicious stack of hamburgers to spice up his party. You happily oblige handing over $20 worth of burger goodness. 
The catch? He tells you to send him the bill and promises to pay you next week. This scenario is a classic example of accounts receivable. It's the money owed to your burger business for goods sold on credit. So even though you've handed over the hamburgers, you're still waiting for that $20 payment. That $20 is your accounts receivable from the customer. Now think of Apple. When they sell their iPhones to a big corporate client but are patiently waiting for the payment, it shows up on their balance sheet as an accounts receivable. Moving on, we have inventories. These are like the treasures waiting to be unleashed. In Apple's case, it's those sleek iPhones, iPads, and MacBooks stacked up and ready to find their new homes. These are products that have been crafted and are just itching to be sold to eager customers. But here's where it gets intriguing for investors. Keep an eye on these inventory levels. If they start piling up significantly, it could be a red flag. It might signal that the company is struggling to move its products, and that's something you definitely want to know as an investor. Consider this. Even tech giants like Apple's rival, Microsoft, aren't immune to inventory challenges. Let me take you back to 2013, where Microsoft encountered a massive hiccup. In that year, Microsoft faced a staggering loss of nearly $1 billion on one of its products. Why? Because they miscalculated demand big time. They manufactured way more of this product than they should have, believing customer demand would be through the roof. But alas, reality struck and demand fell far short of their expectations. The result? Microsoft's investors were left with a hefty bill, footing nearly a billion dollars in losses. Now, here's the twist. Microsoft is a powerhouse, and they managed to bounce back and recoup that loss within a week or two. But for other businesses, especially retailers or department stores, this inventory line on the balance sheet is absolutely critical. For these businesses, proper inventory management is a lifeline. A miscalculation, like Microsoft's, can have devastating consequences. It can lead to excess stock that doesn't move, tying up capital, and potentially forcing markdowns to clear the shelves. It's a high-stakes game that can make or break companies in the retail world. Now let's shift our focus to the line titled Property, Plant, and Equipment, or PP&E for short. PP&E represents the physical assets a company owns, and these assets typically have a lifespan longer than one year. Think of things like vehicles, furniture, computers, machinery, buildings, and land. For instance, Apple's colossal $5 billion headquarters, known as Apple Park, falls into this category. The size of the PP&D number can give you insights into how capital intensive an industry is. Industries that require significant investments in physical assets, like railroads, oil companies, or auto manufacturers, are considered capital intensive. A nifty way to gauge just how capital intensive an industry is involves dividing PP&E by the company's annual revenue. This calculation reveals how much property, plant, and equipment it took for a company to generate a specific amount of revenue. For instance, let's do this analysis with Apple. We find that PP&E makes up 11% of its annual revenue. This suggests that Apple operates in a relatively capital light industry, the opposite of a capital intensive one. Now consider a company like Union Pacific, a railroad company that traverses the Western United States. If we run the same calculation, we get a whopping 277%. This stark contrast highlights just how much more capital-intensive Union Pacific is when compared to Apple. It's a captivating way to assess industries and the financial muscle required to thrive within them. Now let's delve into the liability section of the balance sheet, starting with accounts payable. Think of this line as the counterpart to accounts receivable. While accounts receivable is money owed to the company by its customers, Accounts payable is the money that Apple owes to its suppliers for products and services it has already received but hasn't paid for yet. For instance, consider a scenario where the company that supplies glass for the front of the iPhone sends Apple $100 million worth of glass during the month. Apple has indeed received the glass from its supplier, but until Apple settles the bill, the amount owed, in this case $100 million, appears in the line titled Accounts Payable.
it's essentially a record of the company's outstanding bills to its suppliers. Let's dig into another crucial line item, deferred revenue. This one's particularly significant for software and tech companies, and the perfect example is Netflix. When you subscribe to Netflix, you pay upfront, let's say $15. You fork over that $15 at the start of the month, granting you access to Netflix for the entire month. But here's where it gets interesting. Due to accounting regulations, the company can't label that $15 as revenue right away. They have to wait until they've actually delivered the service to you, like giving you a full month of Netflix access. Until then, that $15 sits in the deferred revenue category. This practice is common in subscription-based software businesses, including the likes of Netflix, Microsoft, Adobe, and Salesforce. For Apple, their deferred revenue would stem from their services sector, encompassing offerings like Apple Music and iCloud storage. It's a fascinating aspect of financial reporting, shedding light on how companies recognize and handle revenue in various industries. Moving on to commercial paper, it's super short-term debt, usually around 30 days, used by companies to cover daily operational expenses, like payroll and supplier payments. The key difference? It's incredibly short-term compared to the next line, term debt. Now, we're diving into the most critical aspect of analyzing a company's balance sheet, understanding its debt. When it comes to Apple, their debt is broken down into three categories, commercial paper, the recurrent portion of term debt, and the non-current portion of term debt. Quick reminder, current means the debt is due within 12 months, while non-current means it's due beyond that time frame. To calculate what I call Apple's true debt, we need to add these three lines together. Combining the $6,000 of commercial paper, the $9,613 of current debt, and the $109,106 of non-current debt, we arrive at Apple's total debt, $124,719. Understanding a company's debt is pivotal in assessing its financial health and obligations. Let's take this analysis one step further by calculating what's known in the investing world as net debt. It's a straightforward calculation. Just subtract the company's cash from its total debt. This reveals the net amount of debt that the company can't pay off immediately. When we apply this to Apple, the result is quite intriguing. Negative $65,097. In essence, this means that, theoretically, Apple doesn't have any debt on its balance sheet because its cash reserves exceed its debt. Subtracting the cash a company has from its debt amount helps us see the actual net debt that the company can't readily pay off. At first glance, you might be concerned about that hefty $124 billion debt figure but when you realize that Apple holds a whopping $190 billion in cash, suddenly that debt number doesn't seem all that worrisome. Understanding net debt is a game changer for investors, offering a more accurate picture of a company's financial strength. Now, let's illustrate this point using another company, Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola holds $42,793 in debt and has $10,914 in cash. To calculate Coca-Cola's net debt, we simply subtract the cash amount from the debt amount, leaving us with a net debt of $31,879. Now here's where it gets interesting for us as investors. Is this net debt figure considered large or not? Well, that depends entirely on how much money the company generates. For instance, if Coca-Cola rakes in a hefty $10 billion in annual profits, Having $1 billion in debt would be relatively small in comparison. However, if another company makes only $100 million in profit annually, that same $1 billion in debt could indeed be crushing and potentially push it toward bankruptcy. So, when assessing a company's net debt, it's crucial to consider it in the context of the company's overall financial health and its ability to manage and service that debt. The scale matters. An essential tool for assessing a company's debt sustainability is the net debt to EBITDA ratio. It's a simple calculation. You take the company's net debt and divide it by its annual EBITDA. 
which serves as an indicator of cash flow. For instance, in 2020, Coca-Cola had an EBITDA of $10,533. When we divide Coca-Cola's net debt by this EBITDA figure, we arrive at a net debt to EBITDA ratio of 3.03. But the real magic happens when you compare this ratio to competitors within the same industry. Different industries employ varying levels of debt to run their operations, so it wouldn't be meaningful to compare Coca-Cola's ratio to, say, a high-growth software company. However, pitting it against peers in the consumer packaged goods sector, such as Nestle or Procter & Gamble, can offer valuable insights. By doing this, you can assess whether Coca-Cola's debt is within a reasonable range compared to others in the same industry, providing a clearer picture of its financial health. Now, I won't dwell too long on the shareholder equity section because as an investor, your primary focus should be on understanding a company's assets and liabilities. However, there's one investment metric that's worth your attention, and that's return on equity, ROE. ROE is calculated by taking a company's net income from the income statement and dividing it by the company's total shareholders' equity. This metric reveals how efficiently a company uses its capital to generate profits. It's expressed as a percentage. For Apple, let's take its 2021 net income of 94,640 and divide it by the total shareholders' equity of 63,090. This calculation yields a remarkable ROE of 150%. Now the real power of ROE lies in comparing it to competitors within the same industry. Take Samsung, one of Apple's rivals for instance. Care to guess their ROE? It's 17%. This stark contrast showcases just how exceptional Apple is at generating substantial profits with relatively minimal shareholders' capital. It's no wonder Apple holds the title of the world's most valuable company. And there you have it. If you found this information valuable, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to WealthWise Finance. If you're eager to explore more videos in this series, including how to analyze an income statement and a cash flow statement, you can find them right here. Keep learning and making informed financial decisions. Talk to you all soon.